Thank you, Scott. Lots of blood vessels in the body we're getting to talk about here. I'm going to talk about the blood vessels that uh, supply the pump that pumps the blood for all of the things that you've been hearing about. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, our projection maybe needs to squeeze in just a little bit. Thank you. I have a couple of disclosures uh, that are germane to this talk. So when I think about coronary heart disease, and of course this is an incredibly prevalent uh, disease, in fact atherosclerotic heart disease uh, arguably is more prevalent than almost every other uh, disease process that we'll be talking about in this meeting combined, uh, I think about it as a problem of any vascular bed and that of supply and that of demand. And the supply is by the coronary arteries and the demand is by the myocardium. And so when trying to determine what is going to be significant or not significant, uh, we uh, need to understand uh, the relationship between these two. Uh, and uh, the cause, of course, uh, on the supply side is coronary lesions. On the effect side, uh, we see myocardial ischemia. Um, so uh, there are two uh, tools that have emerged, one on the supply side and one on the demand side, that have begun to address this question about uh, what is significant. Uh, FFRCT, fractional flow reserve, is an important uh, diagnostic element that has emerged on the supply side. Myocardial perfusion imaging with CT on the uh, on the demand side. And so uh, from the standpoint of asking the question, what is a significant lesion? What is a significant coronary lesion? Uh, the, the first uh, question uh, should be, um, uh, does the image appear normal or not? And then uh, we might uh, extend it a little further and say, well, a significant lesion is a lesion that is greater than 50%, a 50% stenosis. Uh, and then we might look to be a little bit more uh, specific and say, actually, in order to be significant, a lesion should have a specific pressure drop that we observe. Uh, and uh, if that... Uh, uh, taking it to the next level, we might say, well, it should only be a lesion that's associated with myocardial ischemia. Uh, and then one could make the argument, well, even that may not be relevant. What is relevant is whether or not it tells us whether revascularization of the lesion is possible, and if revascularization occurs, will the patient's outcomes improve? And then ultimately, we'd like to know whether or not uh, we are actually improving the patient's health without substantial uh, increase in costs. And the, the sweet spot really for all of this at this point in time uh, is in this region here. And it is getting to the point where we're moving beyond the visualization of stenosis where we're trying to look at the functional characteristic from supply and demand side. Now, this is a particularly pertinent problem and question to address uh, because uh, data have emerged, such as this paper here from the New England Journal, that show that 40% of patients who go to the cath lab have normal coronary arteries. And this is an indication, A, of the ineffectiveness with which we have been evaluating coronary arteries before sending patients to a highly invasive and expensive test, uh, but B, what is really an incredibly inefficient use of a very expensive resource, being the cath lab, to image patients who are ultimately normal. And so one could make a very strong argument that the focus and goal of our imaging, a very laudable focus, would be to fix this problem and to make it so patients who go to invasive coronary angiography are patients who have disease that needs to be fixed. So, what is the disease that needs to be fixed? And I, I mentioned fractional flow reserve uh, quickly, but I want to talk a bit about this because this has been a paradigm shift in coronary disease. The understanding that when one measures this characteristic of a coronary lesion, which is a characteristic that is the pressure drop across that lesion during maximum vasodilation, the way it's done is a pressure transducing wire is placed into the coronary artery during invasive angiography, an adenosine infusion uh, is performed, and the pressure distal to a lesion and the pressure in the aorta is measured, and the ratio is the fractional flow reserve. And a fractional flow reserve of 0.8 is a threshold that is considered to be hemodynamically significant. Now, you know, that sounds uh, great in principle. It's a measure, it's a functional measure, but ultimately what is really important is it is a predictor of outcomes. 
And so you are seeing here the results of the FAME trial, a very, very important trial that has subsequently been validated on uh, further uh, investigations, large multicenter trial, which basically established that if a patient goes to the cath lab and only gets a stent by virtue of an FFR threshold, that they will have a 33% reduction in the risk of death or major cardiac events as opposed to somebody who goes and gets the stent based on the visual appearance of the coronary arteries. So this has essentially changed the paradigm for cardiologists in the cath lab that they want to focus on the FFR, they have to measure the FFR, and it's only those patients who get stented. And that has a long-term improvement, a very measurable and significant improvement in their outcomes. So we have had the benefit of about 15 years of data with robust CT angiography to assess the performance of CTA relative to catheter angiography. But with the shift of significance to FFR, the relevant question is, is how does a stenosis seen at CTA compare to FFR as the reference standard? And what these data show you, and this is a comparison basically of a CTA, uh, you see uh, in the plot, uh, stenosis by CT less than 50%, greater than 50% on this side, these are presumably hemodynamically significant. All of the multicenter trials of the last decade were based on this. But when you use FFR as a reference standard, you realize that 75% of them are false positives. They all have normal FFRs. And so looking at a lesion like this is insufficient to make uh, this particular assessment on its own. So what has been introduced is the possibility of using computational fluid dynamics, which is a, a computational process that is applied to uh, the CT uh, data set, and it is used then as a means to provide a basis for calculations of blood flow and the a simulation of a hyperemic state, which is what occurs during invasive fractional flow reserve, and thus the ability to then calculate a map of FFR, simulated FFR, throughout the coronary tree. And so this consequently has been called FFR-CT. It, it is, as I say, a highly computationally intensive method um, that has uh, begun to undergo some fairly robust evaluation. This was a study back in 2011, a multi-center prospective trial of patients uh, and looking at uh, CTA images versus FFRCT, where the reference standard is catheter-based FFR. And so if catheter-based FFR is on the vertical axis, here is the CT of less than 50%, here is the CT uh, stenosis of greater than 50%, and here's what happens when you take the same scans and you just calculate FFR CT. And uh, here you have a threshold of uh, greater than 0.8 and less than 0.8. And in fact, what you see is a 70% reduction in false positives from what you get when you look at the image to what you get when you calculate the FFR. Now, of course, this is promising, but ultimately the proof is in the outcomes. And uh, so we're, we, we're going to want to look at that. Uh, here you can just see from this same study the substantial improvement, though, in specificity, accuracy, improving 26% with FFRCT. So very recently, just in September of this year, uh, there was this uh, fast track uh, hot topic presented at the European uh, Heart Society, and uh, in this particular case, what this is, is this is a study, a multicenter study of fractional flow reserve by CT uh, at, versus uh, usual care as a means of assessing patients uh, with uh, suspected uh, coronary disease. Okay, so uh, let, let me tell you about this trial, because it's really uh, a ter terrifically interesting trial. Basically, they looked at 580 patients, and the 580 patients were divided into two groups. Uh, patients for whom uh, non-invasive testing was planned. In other words, they were not sick enough, they didn't seem like they had symptoms that warranted going directly to the cath lab. Uh, the other group, which was a larger group, here you can see the numbers down here, were planned to go directly to intercoronary angiography, uh, invasive coronary angiography. And so what they did is, is, in these two groups, they randomized patients. They randomized them to either having usual care, which is uh, getting a uh, stress nuclear study, getting a stress echo, what have you, versus getting FFRCT. 
And so let's look at the results here, some key results. Firstly, let, let me just indicate these colors, okay? So the red color means that uh, they had non-obstructive coronary artery disease as defined by going to the cath lab and having an FFR. The blue means that they had significant obstructive CAD, and the green means that they didn't go to the cath lab at all. So firstly, notice that by doing FFRCT, 61% of patients who would have gone to the cath lab didn't go. 61% of caths were eliminated, and in those patients, there were no events at 90 days. Plus, there was no reduction in the prevalence of positive caths in this group. So you would think that if uh, eliminating caths indiscriminately occurred, then there would be a reduction in positive caths, but they're the same. So there was overall a six-fold reduction in negative caths. The red lines are patients who go to the cath lab with non-obstructive disease. So FFRCT, as applied as an outcome measure, has resulted in a six-fold reduction in patients going with negative caths. And there was no significant increase in downstream catheterization amongst patients who had non-invasive testing planned. So these are really uh, very uh, important and remarkable results and an indication of how CT potentially can step up and uh, provide us with the quantitative data that ultimately will substantially impact patient outcomes and utilization of this very expensive catheterization lab resources. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention though is, is that the uh, on the demand side is the myocardial perfusion. And it has been possible for a while, these images from Joe Schaff, uh, were uh, are probably about seven years old now, uh, very nicely showing a uh, correlation of a CT myocardial perfusion with a SPECT image, and here showing how one can uh, measure the time course uh, in, uh, in uh, normal uh, tissue as well as in uh, disease tissue here with CT and its association uh, for MR. CT perfusion has really been maturing, and particularly with the emergence of wide area detectors. I just want to share with you a little d uh, data around the performance of CT perfusion because CT perfusion is another important tool potentially in helping us assess the significance of a coronary lesion. Firstly, uh, I want to show you this article here, which is a nice meta-analysis of 13 articles uh, of uh, CT perfusion compared to catheter angiography. Only two of them actually use a reference standard of FFR on a per-vessel analysis, and let me show you those data here. Um, what they show is, is that the data are highly variable. Here is a study where CT perfusion has a 68% sensitivity, here a 93% sensitivity. Specificity when the sensitivity is low is quite high. Specificity is lower. These are different points on an ROC curve, but give an indication uh, that these are not necessarily ideal values. But what I want to finish with as we uh, conclude this topic uh, is the, are these data here. This is another study that was just published this year. This is the CORE 320 study, which was a multi-center study performed uh, by uh, centers using the Toshiba 320 row scanner, 16 different centers around the world. 381 patients were referred for invasive coronary angio, and they had a CTA, they had a CT perfusion, and they had a SPECT myocardial perfusion imaging study, the whole kit and caboodle. And uh, with that, it provided the basis uh, for looking at the effectiveness of uh, the combination of CTA and CTP uh, in the setting of suspected myocardial ischemia. And they define in this study flow-limiting disease as a patient who has at least a 50% stenosis plus an associated SPECT myocardial perfusion imaging defect. And here's just a quick example. One patient here that's negative, you can see a little stenosis in the coronary artery, uh, but the perfusion is normal. Uh, and uh, here is the SPECT MPI, um, which uh, in this case is uh, normal as well. Here is uh, one that's positive. Here is the lesion in the coronary artery. Here, hopefully, you can see this little flow-limiting, uh, stress-induced uh, lesion here. And here you see it on the stress MPI. So how does it all perform? So the red boxes are boxes that indicate that CT angiography alone is significantly better than the combination of CTA plus CTP. 
The green boxes are circumstances where CTA in combination with CTP are significantly better than CTA alone. And so what you'll notice is, is that when CTP is thrown in the mix, the sensitivity goes down significantly. The specificity improves significantly. And this is for all patients and, and separating patients who've had prior diagnosed uh, coronary artery disease versus those who have no previous history of CAD. So these data are probably the most robust data that we have on performance of coronary uh, CT perfusion. To me, they're, they're a bit worrisome, and they do not really indicate that at least at this stage it's ready for prime time or clinical use. I, I don't know exactly where it will fit in the uh, ultimate application clinically, but uh, this, is, uh, th this is one study, we'll need more data, uh, but uh, certainly cause for pause. So let me summarize by saying that the target for significance in coronary disease has changed. It is based on fractional flow reserve. Coronary CTA, based on visual assessment, is challenged by false positive results when compared to FFR, and consequently, assessing the significance of coronary lesions depends upon more than just looking at the image and assessing luminal narrowing. FFRCT and CT perfusion are both new technologies with encouraging early results, particularly for those with challenging coronary CTA findings, and I think that we're going to have a very interesting period over the next few years as the use case for coronary CTA finally emerges as showing a value-based approach in terms of reducing costs uh, and improving outcomes in patients by preventing folks from going to the cath lab who don't need to be there. I thank you kindly for your attention.